I like companions. The Discord voted for Tiny Tina's Wonderlands and it has a lot of companions. And if you're wondering about the cooking video, we all knew that was there as a joke answer and now I've got to figure out how to follow through on that for reasons that I don't fully understand. So anyway, slap on your copyright law, praise the mouse, and try to catch up with an uncomfortable number of new releases because it's time to hail Hydra. Is that still a thing? I haven't been up to date on the MCU since possibly ever. Well, don't worry. You've got plenty of time to do so since the intro to the game is very fist forward with its not having the spell I'm after and all that going on. Also, this is a video that you can pause at any time. The future is incredible like that, isn't it? For those that don't know, Hydras are a semi-varied group of summons that will spit various elemental damage as a foes and are primarily accessible through spells. As such, I'm starting off as a class that will get to slot in two spells at once at level 7. Once I get my hands on them, I won't be dealing damage through any other methods. Standard affair. In the meantime, I'll have to settle for getting my hands on this Rivula fellow. More accurately, my spells all over them because I've already punched this thing to death before and it was really boring. Sue me. Now, if Kingdom Hearts has taught me anything, it's that I'm going to need the power of smiles to move this gummy ship and friendship to best every hurdle. A great evil was unleashed into this world, and with everyone eventually becoming a Disney property anyway, I guess that evil might as well be Gary the Snail. You know, the pet from that beloved cartoon that they haven't purchased just yet by the name of Better Call Saul. I skipped through the first encounter because it's not even a little mandatory and made my way to the scariest thing that I'd face in this game. Farming. In this case, vendor farming. I reset the area until I found my first Hydra, and felt pretty good about things. It was a blue spell after all, which is nice to see. Or, it would be, if it didn't suck. Most Hydras pop up wherever you aim when you cast the associated spell, and these ones continuously output a really low damage AoE centered on themselves. They don't move, and that's it! Unless you want to count the nice and overly long cooldown as a feature. Because I would not. So I farmed again until I got an acid spitting Hydra instead, and it wasn't good, but it sucked just a little less. Only a little though. The damage it does is more consistent, but worse. Also, Hydras almost universally seem to aim too high, so at longer ranges they'll shoot over enemies. It's as if they're accounting for bullet drop that just isn't there. Also, are you seeing this cooldown? It's incredible! Right off the bat, this was somehow feeling like a cross between the Demi Lich run and the Iron Cub run, but with worse accuracy and a better story. Being the person that I am, I figured applying an ample amount of brute force to the problem would be a workable solution. After all, surviving wasn't that hard right now, and I was talking to some friends while playing, so I didn't have much else to do. But after seeing just how much hard drive space footage this game takes up, I realized pretty quickly that I was going to have to change something about goings on. So after having a brief chat with Peter Pan during the siege on his home and people, I said, hold on, stay right there. Time doesn't pass normally in Neverland, and people don't die in kids' films anyway, so it should be fine that I left a train against the first boss off-screen so I could dual cast Hydras with one of them being of the haunting variety. Spoilers, haunting is basically the only kind of Hydra worth using. And it's technically a pixie. But it's a Hydra spell, so I'm counting it. The things will follow enemies, firing considerably more frequently, and all around just dealing more damage than pretty much anything that the other varieties can muster. Other types need not really apply. With its help, we were able to save the day, with only cat a strop hick. What kind of word is that? Ah, whatever. If the casualties have a descriptor that starts with cats, then how bad could they possibly be? I did so well that I was immediately trusted to go on a mission that would continue to haunt me for an incredible amount of time. I was surprised and delighted by the Hydra's ability to kill things through a gate, even in spite of struggles they'd had through walls before. And yes, I know that stands to reason, but of every pigment, of every shade I could be colored this day upon seeing a basic level of competence for my summons, the only one you could color me was shocked. Also, I'm not sure how, but I forgot how genuinely dangerous the crabs are in this game. Why are they one of the most deadly enemy types? There are a plentiful amount of undead pirates with guns. And big crabs? Nature is scary. I briefly contemplated the efficacy of trap farming for experience again before moving on to a boss that... I, I mean, it's fine. There's nothing really wrong with it, at least. The singularity attack is a little obnoxious, but nothing horrible. The arena's pretty good. It's basically just one among many kind of big undead enemies, but I mean, I like using undead in my games too. Can't fault them for that. No, I have very different problems with this boss that we'll get to later. And no, I'm not counting killing the boss via the sword because it's a quest item that did no damage in spite of stabbing and absorbing the ghost. We have a word for the kind of semantics that disqualify runs for that sort of thing around these parts. Or at least I do. Is boring. It's fair, but also boring. Like, come on! I'm getting a promotion! I've been aiming for this for a while! And that joke might be getting a bit too obscure. 
I don't even remember Aim's affiliations within the comics or shows. Either way, twas not to be. On this day, I would go from friend of Hydra's to slightly better friend of Hydra's, and I'll tell you right now, there's no way I'm getting through things with any sort of half measure like that. Did come with a new boat though, which was neat. One that I wasn't allowed to sail until I got approval from Gage the Mechromancer from everyone's favorite game in the franchise, Poker Night 2. Yeah, but you forgot that was a thing. To get to her, I'd need to fight through countless enemies. Not because the number's absurdly high, it's more just an issue of me not wanting to count past the number one, and the number is probably above one. I'm not sure, I, I didn't count it. While twin casting was certainly helpful, it was just barely enough to feel better than my Lich Associate from the last playthrough. The range is better, and the damage is better, but the downtime made it feel about as balanced as my brain chemistry in a bad day, which is to say not. Regardless, they were good enough to propel me into the next area, where I was able to meet up with Mrs. Puff to get my boating license. Luckily, I was able to catch her before the seasonal rot did, and there was plenty of patience to boot. Because hot damn did this take a minute. I may not be high level, but one of my primary sources of damage is currently about half my level. If we just ignore that fact, and that it took entirely too long to clear this place out, things were going relatively fine. If we also helpfully ignore my lack of survivability, and being myself also underleveled for the area. That last bit, I didn't notice for a while. This area introduces some skeleton seers that can teleport and instantly get their shield back. This would be a problem if Hydras weren't incredible. Which is why this was a problem. Dancing around the battlefield between groups of enemies that both wanted me dead, I waited for my spells to come off cooldown. Stacking a max of two, count them two, spell charges. If I waited for it to teleport and then fired off all four between the two spells, I was able to do actual health damage, meaning the fight was absolutely possible. As long as they would target the correct enemy and not just like a wall or something. Repeating the process several times over for every seer in the area, I was able to mow through several crowds of enemies and make my way to the area boss. If you like running around in large ovals repeatedly before mediocre DDR with such complicated actions as jump and duck, then this is the fight for you. I tell you what, she has attacks? A whole sum of them? I remember struggling more with her before. This wasn't fast by any definition, but I barely remember anything about the fight itself. It was apparently around 20 minutes, which doesn't even get it close to the top 5 longest boss fights I've done. I don't think it's even qualified for top 10. On a related note, Avatar The Last Airbender is an incredible show, and conversations about it are an incredible way to spend long and tedious boss fights. Would recommend. It did more for me than any other sort of strategy really needed to. I finally found the beautiful man of the hour, who is a fantastic example that masculinity doesn't need to be proven. There's no denying that Brick is a terrifying force of nature, and he's secure in who he is. There is no amount of color or frills that can make him any less threatening. He's not afraid to be himself, and that's manly as hell. If you look at someone wearing something that doesn't align with your preconceived notions about this person that you don't even know and think less of them for it, then I've gotta ask. How did you become such a coward that having fun and looking nice scares you? Be better. People deserve to live how they want, and I hope we can all aspire to explore who we are like this gentleman. For his name is Brick, and he is the prettiest. Torg is absolutely trying for that role though. I love how wholesome he is. A masterclass in how to turn a joke into a reasonably good character. What if someone really liked explosions and yelled all of their lines? I, I mean, that's fine. But what if they were also just a really cool dude? He's not hiding under a facade. There isn't some darker sort of feelings underneath. This is who he is. Explosions and friendship, hand in hand. All with a supreme hatred of the ocean. Utterly beautiful. I would be pretty immediately met with a crabbier mood, though, as I was able to brute force my way through a lot of things. But before I knew it, I was being faced with a message letting me know that I should be about six levels higher than I already am. Over half of my current level. Like, okay, thanks weird level scaling system. And thus, it would begin. The need to level, and with enemies always scaling up to my level but not down to it, I would be stuck needing to get to about level 30 anyway to fight the end boss, so I went back to one that's easily cheesed. By running off the side without jumping, you can descend far enough to trigger the boss while also landing high enough to jump back. There is a vendor next to me, and so I can do some minor vendor farming while slowly fighting the same boss over and over again. And seriously, I mean slowly, just sitting next to this boss arena for several hours. My gear got underleveled, I pretty quickly got bored as all get out, my schedule was weird, so I couldn't really talk to anybody. My one saving grace is that I've been meaning to get around to watching Breaking Bad, so I ended up watching multiple seasons of that while sitting here spamming right and left bumpers. Fifteen years late to the party, but at least I got to experience it to the tune of entirely too much farming. I'm just glad it was mindless farming so I could do something else at the same time. After that nightmare, I spent a while outside of Bright Hoof checking the vendors for new gear. I think it's faster? 
I don't know, having something to do really takes the edge off of optimization, which is to say that I didn't mind going a bit slower while seeing a story unfold before me. One that I now have to find the time to finish. The inevitable issue of too many things to do and not enough time to do them aside, I got to a skeleton pirate section that really started to hammer home that while I think a lot of this game is genuinely good, it does sort of drag in terms of just going. I get wanting players to hear and engage with the story, but I think a big key to Borderlands 2 being so beloved is the ecosystem. You can pay attention while also blowing past things. You're not just stuck in place like you so often are in Borderlands 3. Story is important for games, but things being interactive is also a huge thing. It's why you'll see people shoot random objects in shooters so often. It's the primary method you have to interact as a player. So when you don't know what else to do, you pull the trigger. Similar to how we as people touch things or speak to things. It's just how we do, so we do. When the game strips all that away and becomes a sitting sim instead, what am I supposed to do with all this energy? And while Borderlands 2 has a lot of mandatory combat, it doesn't feel encounter-based. You run to a place, you do a thing, there may or may not be a fight. There are whole areas where you don't have to fight anything to complete multiple objectives. It makes it more interesting because it's more varied. Here and in 3, you better believe your objective comes with a blood tax, and it does get kind of dull fast. Complaints aside, the Mobley Dick, Biter of Crews, Scourge of Salt and Sand joke is still genuinely really funny. And while there was a sort of disillusionment with my patience having worn a bit thinner, the sea shanties in this locale are still fantastic. Maybe not technically speaking, but the beauty of a shanty lies not in the technique, but in spirit. It's not something you simply sing, it's something that you feel. It's also important to note that some of the hydras can explode. This can be used in some situations to damage plot important targets like this guy's mug. Not always, but in many of them. One of the biggest downsides of the place is seeing names like Cabin Boy come up as a mini-boss, and my brain can only read that in the voice of Scroop from Treasure Planet. And that film is criminally underrated. I fought a bunch more micro-bosses, got a reminder that the team behind this game is always punctual, and made my way through Backstory Boulevard to the real area boss. And it's genuinely surprising just how hard Gwachance got melted. He held up about as well to the Hydras as Cotton Candy would to me. I can run. I can hide. I can pretend that I don't want it. But when push comes to shove, that candy floss is getting devoured because it's delicious. You just can't beat cravings forever, my guy. You never stood a chance. Did I just steal that joke from a game that's not even two years old? Yeah. It was like taking a skeleton man from a baby. Wait, that's not how that- I have mixed feelings on the serpent enemies in the game. They're not incredibly varied, but they move in a more alien fashion. It's cool, but it seems like it'd be a lot harder to try to hit them while they're weaving around the battlefield if you're using a gun. Which means you have an enemy that's actually harder without artificially increasing things like their health and damage. Which is absolutely a step in the right direction with things like OP levels under their belt. On the other hand, they seem like a pain in the ass. Speaking of, there's a weirdly accurate portrayal of Randy rubbing his grubby little mitts together while giving new characters. I love them, so you have to as well, right? Regardless of how much the playgroup was ignored to make said characters happen. Weird that they'd use Tina for that, though. At the very least, Randy's weird insert character helps out during this encounter, bringing my total possible helpers up to a theoretical six. This, of course, being up until she would have actually helped. As for Drill, no. Just, no. I'll forgive this boss for existing when... probably never. So I lowered the game difficulty. Up until now, I was playing on Intense aside from during farming, because it makes no difference outside of time spent doing it. And you'll notice that the title says nothing about the difficulty. I could have been playing on super easy baby mode this whole time, but no. The change happened here because surviving his attacks while dealing with his shield recovery is a problem, and dodging him is about as effective as reasoning with a toddler. Also, you may or may not have noticed that my shield isn't coming back. This is a deliberate choice. Does it make the game harder? Absolutely. But it also gives me 30% more damage, which is huge. I get some of my shield back whenever I cast something, which inevitably means that my shield is rarely ever full, but it's worth it for that sweet, sweet DPS. The battle plan was pretty simple. Wait for him to get close, and then throw down as many hydras as I can manage. This was true of all of his phases, but especially the lightning one. Otherwise, the impalers served both to bring me back into the fight and to drop health items, which is nice, because I think they consistently do more damage to me than he does. The rest of the strategy behind this fight is just performing the constant balancing act that is healing during this, because this just feels poorly structured. Most boss arenas at least kind of let you get away from the mobs, and most mobs aren't so fast, damaging, or anything of the sort. Them being so low on health is nice, but it doesn't make up for their spawn rate. Can you imagine if the skags during the Bloodwing fight were frequently rabid? About 17 minutes of boss fight later though, and I was off to a canyon. After getting to jump pads, I accidentally and immediately hit my controller against my desk. Serves me right for trying to ground pound though. Anyways, this map genuinely has a fantastic sense of scale. This place is huge, and the game comes right out of the gate swinging. 
Look at these rocks. They're huge. Look at that elevator. It's huge. Look at that guy. He's normal size from the human perspective, but is relatively not huge. I got hit with some heavy deja vu while waiting for these random mobs to slowly bleed the code out of themselves because that's the only way a fight is going to go quick. I've heard these sorts of runs described in a lot of ways. Things like it's not a challenge because it's just waiting. And that's a fair perspective to have. There aren't a ton of fun tricks to pull out of my hat for things like this, and the good majority of a task like it comes down to my patience as a player and handling relatively minor problems as they arise. It's not really as skill focused as something like a shield run, and it's not as knowledge heavy as a starter pistol run, but I do enjoy these from time to time. There's something about the hands-off playstyle that just does it for me, automating my offense and seeing how they stack up to the game as a whole. I didn't know if these things could handle the game, but I do now. It's a journey that I wanted to go on, and one that I wanted to bring you along for, if you are so willing. That being said, I think I would like to take on something at least a touch more hands-on after this. I did manage to make a rock friend that I carried with me through thick and thin, even off a jump pad, much to my surprise. But nothing can last forever. It's normal and even expected that sometimes you'll grow apart from those that you love. Your values and interests can change. There's nothing wrong with trying to reconnect either, but if not, it's okay. Sometimes it's better for both of you to recognize when you have to let go. Even if it hurts. Goodbye, my friend. I'll miss you. Anyways, here's a boss that hits like a bus that won't slow down and regenerates his shield rapidly via summon that mine refused to target. Mega weenie toddler mode it is, because hey, guess what? Even on said mode, I can't crack that shield bar without some shenanigans. And of what variety, you may ask? Well, I can only reliably break his spectral agus by way of my exploding haunting hydras. And it takes several. So once that's down, what if I just held a gun that gave me a minor buff to some of my spells while also spamming spells, then swapping in some other ones because for some reason spells in your inventory have their own separate cooldown. Doesn't seem like it refreshes while they're not equipped, but I can pretty easily hit the spawn limit of the little buggers to spit a whole lot of pain his way. Then run around the arena, swapping and slowly letting those cool down, and after doing this twice, I was into his last phase. I don't know why this works, but it is certainly a decision. Only considering it on my second playthrough, but it's kind of funny how the game more or less ignores a lot of the open world, almost teleporting between set pieces via walking at the speeds we're going, much like a lot of TTRPG groups because travel is overlooked. Granted, it can really start to drag, but it's funny how well they emulated that via the open world. Anyways, mobbing. So much mobbing. All enemies have bested, and even in-game characters are getting tired of constant fighting just for the sake of it. The remedy to this? More mobbing, of course. Building something big and climactic is hard, not denying that. I'm not even saying that this isn't that, but my heart really wasn't in it around this stage, so it's a good thing that the Hydras were, because they had a pretty good handle on things all on their own. I was able to pull some fantastic coward strats and just stand outside of some aggro ranges, which made things a bit more comfy. And familiar. Not nearly long enough to watch a full episode of something, but you can't win them all. After entirely too many encounters without so much as a short rest, I got to the nightmare of the hour. A pun that beats the heck out of the boss fight. Which is maybe a tad unfair. It's not horrendous outside of the invincibility periods. I'm really not a fan of them, but it's otherwise an alright gimmick boss. It almost feels like the direct evolution of the Banshee. The way the boss demands you to be in the right place at the right time and do the right thing to avoid everything. Phase 1 is either running, which is easy, or using cover to stop from getting beat up. Phase 2 is a lot more interesting. I never figured out how to reliably dodge her vertical sword swings, but the rest were variations of going over or under things. Just as long as you don't get pushed in anything by enemies, because having something for Save Your Soul is nice, but can't it be nice over there instead of right in my face? What's worse is twofold. My summons will frequently attack them instead of her, meaning they do almost nothing, and worse, she can kill them. If they're struck or touch her when they're being summoned, they just die instantly, meaning they do even less. Nothing quite like waiting for a full cooldown just to watch them spawn and then despawn. After stallioning long enough to bring her to her ponies, I managed to make it through. And the game really started gelding to the point with the characters taking the time to air their game-related traumas. It's okay. Discussing the tales and trials of that guy is how we learn and grow to avoid repeating mistakes. Especially if and when we learn that it was we who were the problem all along. Mercifully, the majority of things that came after just involved running. The crystals I needed to break were immune to my hydras, but were powerless to a good boppin'. There was some more mobbing, which just comes naturally to this part of the game, but there was at least some break between, which was nice. Afterwards was a giant object that can be broken via hydras, but it took an unreasonable number of them. Just kept throwing more summons and it was visibly doing damage, but without a health bar it was hard to say if it was actually progressing me toward my goal of breaking the villain's AC unit. 
And then finally came the boss to end all bosses. Copyright law and its weird patchy enforcement. Well, true to form, the biggest issue is just how effectively it takes Stranglehold. It saps the life out of you without even touching your shield. To skip ahead several steps, I got a shield that would help me to heal while full. And despite dying several times into long attempts, I was determined to retain my inability to recover shields normally. Well, for once, possibly more than once, the Haunting Hydra wasn't actually the way to go. See, they target things at random here. I can have an enemy almost dead right in front of me, and it'll go for someone completely unrelated. By the time it gets to the boss, there's no time left on it, and I'm screwed, because he'll just spawn more. And I mean, I will too, but a lot slower. All the while, I'm being drained of life or knocked off the arena. So I instead used Devouring Hydras, which will spawn another Hydra upon killing an enemy, or sometimes when damaging a boss. They did also come with another major boon. Even beyond being able to use the boss's team of lawyers against them, the Hydras will target enemies with no regard to distance or cover in a lot of cases, so their accuracy is awful. With proper angles, you can force these ones to target the crystals that cause the death goo. The fight is more or less a slow three-dimensional bullet hell with enemies that constantly chase you. With my current setup, I was constantly trying to balance health and shield loss because I had no way to recover health reliably without my shield. With the crystals gone though, it took out one of my biggest considerations. It just came down to whether or not I could outmaneuver him, and the answer to that is a resounding yeah. His charging specters aren't so bad to avoid, and his shield dragons are plenty easy to handle. Y you know, slowly. It was more or less guaranteed that he'd get his shield all the way back every time, but I could even target them from far away, because the Hydra spawn where I point. Then comes what I would firmly argue is his easiest phase. The skeletons are replaced with dragons that also suck. He more or less just floats there menacingly, while Bernadette does a piss poor job at burning any debts, and you cycle between hitting her and him. You'll never guess what type of Hydra is best to use during this phase, though. Not in a million years would you guess that the Haunting Hydra is the best one to use here, not only due to the distance of one of the targets, but the fact that the main boss also distances himself from enemies, thus making the AI considerably better at targeting him, and also their damage isn't even in the same realm. That would be crazy to guess. After being hard carried by the creature that I had a hard time carrying, though, the final boss would go down, thus answering the question that I'm sure was just keeping people up at night and saying that yes, Unfortunately, Hydras can beat Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, but they really shouldn't. With that, though, I hope you enjoyed your time here. You probably know how to use social media, and I hope that means I'll get to hear your thoughts now and on a few writings. A critical thank you to my lovely channel members. For better or worse, it's your support that continues to help bring these puns into the world in which we live. Until the next, though, remember to stay safe, spread some kindness in the world, and I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful, rest of your day. Bye-bye.